How you doing? Good. Hey, from time to time, my name's Mark, by the way. I'm the senior pastor here. And uh, from time to time, people ask me, um, was, I, was I talking specifically or directly to them on a Sunday morning? It's, like, it's almost like you knew what was going on, and it felt like you were talking to me. Or they'll ask, actually, one of the other pastors, like, really felt like Mark was talking to me. And here's what I want to tell you. This morning, if you're in this room or if you are joining us online, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. And I want to tell you that what this, this message, this series that we are currently in, I believe is life-changing, like life-changing. And so today it's one of those things like when I was growing up, you wouldn't believe this, but I, I, I got spanked or I got whooped a few times by my dad. Anybody else that just ever experienced that in their life, like you're just going to get a whooping? And so I've experienced that uh, a few times in my life. It, it came with, uh, like, a belt attached to it. I don't know, like, we don't really talk about that anymore today's culture, but, like, I, a few times, and my dad would, you've probably heard, your parents probably said this just like my dad did, and you wouldn't know my dad was like this. I don't even know he was in the room in the first service, but, you know, you look at my dad, and he's, he's just this gentle, compassionate guy, but I just want you to know, like, he could really lay down a whooping, Okay? And he would use the phrase, and you've heard it, like, this is going to hurt me, son, way more than it's going to hurt you, right? Like, raise your hand if you ever heard that phrase. Guess what? This morning, this is going to hurt you way more than it's going to hurt me, okay? I I said it differently. I said it differently. But this message, I'm telling you, this message, if you lean into it, 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 it's just a, it's so challenging in our life. It's so challenging, right? So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Acts. If you don't have a Bible, but you have your phone, I would encourage you to grab the Bible app, um, or I think there's actually a way for you to get the Bible through uh, the Cornerstone Church app, and just get to the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 9 to start, and then we're also going to go to the book of Philippians chapter 3, okay? So Acts 9, Philippians 3, those are the two places we're going to go, and, um, and I think they're on the screen, so you'll be able to see them, but, but I really believe in this moment, with what God has for us, that uh, if you can, you, you should write some things down in your Bible. I just want to say that. Like, you should just write, underline it, write, okay? I'm just telling you, this is good. This is good. Um, I'd like to pray for a moment before we get started, just like we did last week. We're in this series called Surrender, and surrender is challenging. I want you to know that. Like, surrender is challenging, especially in the culture that we live in today. To, to actually give up, right? Like, to give up ourselves, that, that song that the band led us in first, I love that song. It's been one of my favorites for a lot of years. But it's like this prayer of going, I'm going to lay me down. My life is not my own because I'm following Jesus, right? So that's where I want to get at. So last week, we talked about living palms up, right? A lot of us want to live holding our, our stuff tightly, but God's prying our fingers off. And so palms up, hands out, just believing that God is calling us to something, okay? So I'm going to pray, and if you would like to, I would invite you to open your hands, just put them out just like this, and let's just see what God does in the midst as we make ourselves available to him. Father, we love you. We need you to move powerfully in this moment because, Lord, we are rebellious, and we are independent, and we want our own way. We're like little children. Let's just admit it. And Father, we need you to move in our hearts and change us and encourage us and convict us, Lord. These things in our life that are holding us back from what you are calling us to. So palms up, hands out. We are surrendering in this moment to you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Acts 9 is the story of a guy in the New Testament. You've heard of him. His name is Saul. And Saul, uh, we're going to get kind of the lowdown on it, but, but Saul has this history, right? And so this is what we're going to read about for a moment. And so this is what happens. Acts 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager. Listen, listen to what he says. He was eager to kill the Lord's followers. Doesn't that sound great? goes on, so he went to the high priest, this was his plan, his game plan was he went to the high priest, requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, 
asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way, those are the Christians, that he found there. And he wanted to bring them both, not just men, but he wanted to bring them both men and women back to Jerusalem in chains. So get this picture in your mind of Saul. He's a bad dude. And he wants to go into the synagogues. Anybody that's following Jesus, he wants to basically handcuff them, lead them back to Jerusalem to stand trial. Why? Because the first verse says he wants to kill them. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul looks. Who are you, Lord? He asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what to do, what you must do. Doesn't that sound like, that sounds the way like Jesus rolls, isn't it? Like just rolls. Like here's Saul, persecutor of the church, wanting to kill Christians. He's like, now get up and go do what I'm telling you to do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground. Uh, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind, so his companions led him by hand to Damascus, and he remained there for three days and did not eat or drink. And there was a believer in Damascus, his name was Ananias, and the Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias! The Lord, yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to the straight street, to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. And here's his response. Are you crazy? That's my paraphrase. He says, but Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized, like this guy heard, he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls on your name. And I want, you, I want you to lean in for a minute, verse 15, okay? This is a big deal. Because for a moment, it's like a lot of us feel like it's up to someone else. And here's what I mean. So here's, what, here's what the, how the Lord responds to Ananias. Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my sakes. And here's what I want you to understand this morning, is like, this seemed to make no sense to anybody that was a Christian at that moment, that God would call someone, or he would use someone who had Saul's history. But Jesus in this moment is going, no, no, what you need to understand is I have chosen Saul, yes, persecutor of the church, yes, killer of Christians, but I have chosen him to be my instrument to take the gospel to the Gentiles, to kings, and yes, to even the Jewish people. And here's what I believe is one of the things this morning, like for all of us, and it's this, you are God's chosen instrument for some purpose. God has something that he has ordained for you to do. Ephesians 2.10 talks about how we are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do and accomplish good works which God prepared beforehand for us to walk in them. And you are in a place, hear me, that you are, are God's instrument in some form or some fashion. And many of us are living lives that do not speak to that. But God is calling you in this moment to say, I have a plan for your life. I have something that I want you to do or accomplish for the sake of the gospel. Are you willing to walk in? And here's Paul's response, right? So Ananias went and he found Saul. He laid his hands on him. And, it, um, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up, he was baptized, and afterward he ate some food, regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. Whoa! 
I know you're not nearly as excited about that as I am. So let me, let me just kind of give you a glimpse for a moment. In just a few days, Saul's life was radically transformed. In just a few days, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Jesus like, look, you got to go do what I'm telling you to do. And just a few days later, where he was supposed to go to the synagogues and arrest everybody who was following Jesus, instead, he goes into the synagogues and he actually says, he is indeed the son of God. I'm not here to arrest you. I'm here to proclaim who Jesus is. Why? Because I am now an instrument that God has called to be used for his glory. And you are that same instrument. So here's, here's the deal, though. You're going to have to make a decision in your life. And I don't know that there's any better time than 2021. You know, we're a couple of weeks in. It's going to be a crazy year. Let's just all just buckle up and realize that it's going to be that this year. But yet, you have the opportunity to be an instrument in the hands of the Redeemer, in the hands of our Heavenly Father, to be used to do and accomplish some amazing things. But it's got to start with you making some decisions in your life in terms of who and what you are going to pursue and really make as the pursuit of your life. So let's look at Paul's life. Saul becomes Paul, and honestly, he wrote most of the New Testament. And in Philippians chapter 3, he's writing this letter to the church at Philippi, and this letter would be sent out to not just the church at Philippi, but then it would be sent out to and circulated among other churches so that these churches could be encouraged, yes, by what they were hearing from Paul. And here's, here's what I want you to see is, is Paul's pursuit. Paul's pursuit. Obviously, Paul was an incredibly passionate person because he would before he met Jesus, like he wanted, to, he wanted to kill the people that were following Jesus. And that takes, that takes passion. So incredibly passionate. So he writes this in Philippians 3. He starts out in verse 1. He just says, listen, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things. And I do it to safeguard your faith. Now, one of the things you've got to realize is back then... You know, as these letters were circulated in the church, it would take a while uh, to go from one church to another or from Paul's place where he is writing the letter then to get to the church that he is writing this letter to. It's not like the United States Postal Service. So it's not like he just drops it in the mailbox like a few days later or maybe a week later. You know, it's like, here it is, it shows up. I mean, it would take time to get there. And the same would be true of false teaching that would creep into the church, which is why Paul is actually saying this in verse 1. He's like, hey, I never mind circling back to the gospel, which is a lot of what he had talked about in chapter 2. He talked about Jesus. He talked about Jesus giving up his life and laying down his life for us. He says, listen, I never grow tired of reminding you of the gospel because it serves as a safeguard for your faith. And here's one of the things I want to just encourage you with this morning is that if there was ever a time in our life that we needed to safeguard our faith, it's today. Because it would take, you know, literally weeks or months for that false teaching to creep into churches way back then. But I'm telling you, you turn on your favorite streaming service today and you are going to have messages that are completely opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ coming into your life. And you're going to be hearing some things, and I know it sounds crazy, but you're going to be hearing some things that sound almost, or they're very close to what it looks like, and it sounds good, and you're not quite sure. And what Paul is writing this is like, listen, I want to keep bringing you back to the gospel because it's going to serve as a safeguard for your faith, and we need a safeguard for our faith. It was pretty cool the other night in my house, so so on Friday nights we watch uh, a pizza. We have pizza and movie night in our home, and we're watching this movie, and uh, something's going on in the movie. I can't remember what it was. One of my kids, is. I hear them say, oh, that's not right. Whatever it was that was going on, I can't remember at that moment what it was in that movie, but it's like I was so pleased in that moment that they were able to identify that whatever this truth was that they were talking about in the movie, they're going, nope, that's not right. Because there's so many of us today who can get dragged away so easily by what we're hearing out there in TV land. 
And it seems weird, but at the end of the day, like I said, so many of those messages are so close to what, you know, like it's almost there, but not quite there, you know? And, and where we begin to buy into it, and it begins to drag us away, and Paul's going, no, I want to bring you back to the gospel, because it serves as a safeguard for your faith. And he goes on, he says, watch out, he says, for those dogs, verse 2, we can't really talk like that today, but he did back then. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say that you must be circumcised to be saved. That's what false teachers would do. They'd kind of creep in, say some things that sound pretty good, but then they would start adding. It's like, yeah, you know what? You got to believe in Jesus, but then you also, if you're not a Jew, um, then you also need to be circumcised in order. So basically, you got to become a Jew before you can become a Christian. And Paul's like, nah, you got to watch out for those that are saying this because they are actually mutilators of the flesh. And if you know what circumcision is, you would know he's spot on. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus, here it is, what he has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Here's what I, one of the things I want you to know. It's like this morning, like all of God's favor and all of God's righteousness is yours in Christ Jesus. Like, there's nothing that you can do, nothing that you have to do to earn it. And what Paul is saying in this, he's like, listen, I want you to know, like, nothing is based on human effort. Like, in your life, in your life, you cannot do enough good things to earn your way to God or earn your way to heaven when you die. And you can do not enough good things in your life to earn God's favor. It is yours in Christ Jesus. It's yours. All of God's favor, all of Christ's righteousness, it's yours. And you can stand with your head held light. It's why, I mean, honestly, I mean, think about it. How in the world could a guy like Paul, who used to be Saul, who really enjoyed killing Christians, how in the world? Jesus. Jesus. And he began to realize that. But he goes, he goes on because he realizes this whole idea of human effort because I guarantee there is somebody in this room today, you are trying to earn your way to heaven when you die or you are trying to do enough good things that God would be happy with you. I just want to tell you, like, that's it's impossible. It's impossible. It's yours in Christ. That's what Paul's about to say. He's going, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could, indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. And he goes on. He's going to say why. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. How do you measure up against that? And now here's where, here's where Paul takes this huge turn in what he's saying, right? Because he's, he's really, he's set it up. He's saying, you know, here, like if anybody has a reason to boast, it's me. Look at my, my, my heritage. Look at the things that I've done and accomplished. And now he, he says this, the big change. I once, I once thought these things were valuable. I once, I once thought these things were valuable. I once thought these things were important. Now listen, just, just draw out of this for a minute and think about your own life. What are the things that right now, if you were to evaluate your life, what are the things that you are determining are important and valuable in the things that you are pursuing? What are you determining is important and valuable? Because that's what Paul got to. And now Paul's saying it's something a little bit different, but yet we evaluate our lives based upon all of this. So what is it? Like if you were to just track down, like take a, take a blank piece of paper and start writing these things out, what is, what's important to you? What's, what's truly valuable? And then here's, here's the thing, like don't put, don't put down a Sunday school answer. Like, truly take inventory of your life and decide to go, look, I just want to be completely honest. Like, here's the things, like, if you are evaluating my life, 
here's what it looks like from the outside that I determine are important. He goes on, he says this, I once thought those things were valuable or important, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. The great exchange for Paul. The great exchange. Yes, he goes, everything else is worthless compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Now here's, here's what happened in Paul. Ready? So take, take for example like this part is his heritage in the things that he had done in his life as a persecutor of the church in order to gain the favor of men. And initially Paul says, listen, I've determined that these things are worthless. But then he goes on, he takes this a step further. And this is where it gets so interesting for all of us, right? And now he takes everything else. And it's, it's the everything else that fits into our life. So it's, it's, it, it's realizing that there's all of these other things that go on in our life. Paul in Philippians 4, in this very next chapter, he would go on and he's talking about how he knows what it's like to be well-fed and hungry. He knows what it's like to basically be homeless but have a roof over his head. He knows what it's like to be well-fed, to have plenty, but then to be in need. Like He realizes both of these things in his life. But what he says in Philippians chapter 3 is like, I've determined that not only is my legacy and former pursuit worthless, but I've also determined that these other things in life to which, let's just be honest, most of us are pursuing in this room. And Paul says, I've considered them as worthless as well. And he goes on, he's not finished. He takes it even a step farther. He says, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. So it's like he's stacking all of this up against this infinite value of knowing Jesus. And he's going, listen, I'm taking Jesus every day of the week compared to everything else and every other pursuit that I have in my life. I'm going with Jesus. And then he goes on. For his sake... I have discarded everything else. And, and here's the, 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 the most interesting and fascinating part of, to, to me, this whole thing. I count it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. And let me just let, me just let you know, like the word garbage, not really the word garbage. It's not really the word garbage. Like garbage is the safe word. And in... For me, there, there's a way you could say it that would not be an appropriate word for church. Okay? It's just the word garbage is actually like the word poo. And I've been made fun of in two other services now for saying that. But yet it's true. It's like, it's like my neighbor's. I, I still don't understand why people want a dog, but I love you. If you have one, I love you. But I don't know why you want to clean up poo. I mean, once your kids get out of diapers, you know, it's like, I'm done with that. Unless you have a dog, then you're cleaning it up. But my neighbor, uh, we have literally maybe 10 feet of grass, 15 feet maybe between our homes. But like, it's between our homes is this landmine of dog poo. And, you know, I throw it back in his yard. But this is what Paul is saying. I mean, seriously, like, I want to tell you that. Like, this is what he's saying. Paul is, Paul is literally going, listen, I've measured everything in life. Every pursuit that you can imagine. Everything that you could even begin to fathom. I've tried everything. And he says, I'm telling you, like, it is... It is worthless. It's garbage. It's the poo from the dog. Like, compared to knowing Jesus. I want to know Jesus. And that's what he gets to in the, in the rest of this, right? He says, for his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I may gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. 
Rather, I become righteous through faith in Jesus. Remember when I said, like all of God's favor and all of Jesus' righteousness is yours in Christ Jesus. Like that's what Paul got to. He realized like there's nothing that I can do anymore other than have faith in Jesus. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. But, he, but verse 10, here's the, this very end. He says, I want, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. I want to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Which, by the way, in Romans, he writes to the church in Rome. And he's like, hey, listen, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. Do you get that, Christian? Do you get that, church? Like the same power, which it's a big deal. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody be raised from the dead. Like, I don't know. I don't think we have. I don't think you've seen anybody come walking out of the tomb. So it's a really big deal that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. But for some reason, as Christians, when we are invited to pursue Jesus, we are invited to lay aside all of these worldly pursuits, and we are invited, yes, to be an instrument in the hands of the Redeemer, to be used for good works, to accomplish in this world. We're like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. And we're missing out on so much of what God has for us. And Paul's going, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of the resurrection. I want to, yes, this is where all of us would go, like, I'm good there, but not good. I want to suffer with him. Because I want, like, I want to know that. And then he, I want to suffer with him sharing in his death so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead for myself. And I struggle with verse 11. I'm like, man, what in the world is he talking about? And here's what I believe he's talking about. I just believe he's saying, listen, I know that if I suffer with Jesus, then I know there's a pretty good chance that I'm going to have to lose my life. So one way or another, whether it's through suffering or maybe I just die of, of natural causes or whatever, but I know that I'm going to experience the resurrection from the dead, which is going to be really cool one day. It's the not yet that we were talking about last week, right? So a couple things I want to share with you real quick, tied up. There are three things that happen when you make the decision that you're going to pursue Jesus. There's three things that happen. The first is this. When you pursue Jesus, you're going to have the right foundation. You're going to have the right foundation. That's why he circled back and would circle back in verse 1. He says, listen, I don't mind to keep going over these things with you because it's going to give, be a safeguard for your faith, which basically means you're going to be building on the right foundation when you keep circling back to the gospel. You can't go wrong circling back to the gospel. And I believe as followers of Jesus, the more that we circle back to the gospel, the more that our affection should be stirred towards Jesus and what he did for us. But we have the world like speaking into our ears so often. Some of us, like our foundation's beginning to crumble a little bit. And we need to circle back to the gospel. We need to be reminded of who God is and what he did by sending his one and only son into this world to die on a cross for our sins. Because yes, we are all sinners. We, <laughs> this is difficult for so many of us. Like you're, you're not really a good person. You are a sinner and you need Jesus. It's the whole point of the gospel. You can't earn your way to heaven. You need Jesus. And you need to be reminded of that. So you need the right foundation. That's the first thing that will happen when you keep pursuing Jesus. The second thing is you'll have the right confidence. Paul says, I no longer put my confidence in the flesh, but I'm putting my confidence in Jesus and what he did on the cross. And by the way, with confidence comes like peace in your life. You pursue Jesus and you get to know him the way that Paul is writing in this. It's like I'm pursuing him, I'm getting to know him, and now I have more peace in my life because of Jesus. And so it gives you more confidence in your life. Not like, hey, look at me, I'm more confident. But no, I am confident in who God is and what he's doing around the world. So when a pandemic strikes the world, I'm not throwing off guard because I know there's a God who reigns and hasn't uh, surrendered control. 
So it's like, yeah, it's just a pandemic. God's got it. And I'm not trying to discount the fact that people lost their lives in the middle of this. I'm not discounting the fact that people have gotten sick for this. But I also want you to know that God is up to something. And he is working on our behalf. Because that's what he told us he would do. And I'm confident in that. It gives you the right confidence. And the third thing, it gives you the right values. The right values, the things that you determine are important. The things that you determine in your life are worthy pursuits. That's what Paul is getting at. He's like, I've just, I've, I've kind of weighed these things out and I've gotten to this place where pursuing Jesus is so worth it. It, it. Even if it means letting go of everything else. The pursuit of knowing him, the pursuit of, yes, being an instrument to be used by him in this world for good works, it's worth it. I'm, I'm in for that. Sign me up. Put me in the game. I'm ready to go. These are the things that I've determined are important. But yet there's Christians, for whatever reason, that we're sitting on the sidelines. We're waiting for somebody else to do it. Ananias is like, I don't want to, God. Have you heard about Saul of Tarsus? He's like, I don't care. Go, go talk to him. Okay. Put me in the game, man. God's got something for you. And here it is. Ready? So three things are going to have to happen in your life. You are going to have to determine if pursuing Jesus is worth, and here's the word, sacrifice. Because surrender is going to require sacrifice. Surrender is going to require sacrifice. And you're going to have to sacrifice. Here it is, three things. First one, time. Time. Did you realize everybody has 168 hours in a week? Did a little math, that's what it came out to. Every time, even with the new math. 168 hours a week. We all have the same amount of time. But here's the thing. Most of us are spending our time doing things that don't really matter. <sighs> Told you this is going to hurt you way more than it's going to hurt me. You'll tell me, because I hear people say, you go like, I don't, man, I'm so busy. I don't have time to read the Bible. I don't have time to pray. But yet you like binge watched an entire season of your favorite show yesterday. 45 minutes times however. You get where I'm going. You have to determine, right? Like what's important. You have to determine these things that are valuable to you. Time, yes, is valuable. But stop wasting it on things that don't matter you might be asked to do something to serve in some way in the church in the community do those types of things and i know it's like i'm busy i'm tired blah 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 blah. but pursuing jesus is worth it i'm telling you you'll never regret the things you do for him you'll never regret it so stop stop binge watching and open your bible i know that sounds weird or here you go, like watch one episode and then read the Bible for five minutes, okay? Do you need, a, you need an out? But somehow, some way, open up the scriptures and hear what God is telling you. Like, I know you want to be like Saul, you want to hear the voice, have the vision, but it is more likely that God is going to speak to you through his word than it is that he's going to speak to you any other way. It's going to come through his word. So take the time to pursue Jesus in your life. When, like, you're going to tell me, like, I don't have time to pray. I wish I did. I wish I had more time to pray. But yet, here it is again. It hurts. But we all sit there. I'm ashamed of it, too. Go ahead and look on your phone at the amount of time you spend on your screen because there's a lot of us who are sitting there on our phones and we're mindlessly scrolling through Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and we're looking at people's lives who, by the way, not all that glamorous. But the king of the universe is going, you can come talk to me. Put it down, turn it upside down, I don't care, go put it in your room. But instead of mindlessly scrolling through that stuff, maybe just spend, I don't know, three minutes just talking to God. Man, simple, but most of us don't. Time, comfort is the second one. Comfort leads to complacency. Complacency honestly leads to death. But yet we are 
We are creatures of comfort. I'm not going to lie to you. Like I drove my dad's truck to church this morning. I really miss. He's got a, a truck I've got in, in my life. It's a, 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 I think it's an 04, 05 Yukon. I have heated seats. He doesn't. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you this morning, I really miss my heated seats. <laughs> Coming to church, I don't think it should be this cold anywhere in the world, but it is. It's my own opinion. But beyond that comfort, you know, Matt talked this morning about the widow with two mites. And it's like we, we hear a story like that, and, and uh, we would normally tell you a story like that, and we'll go, it's not that God's asking you this today to give everything, but, but yet I want to tell you that God's asking you today to give everything. Like, I don't want to give you an out. See, we're all used to giving and serving out of our surplus, like the Pharisees in the story that Matt shared, and, and we, we're nowhere near sacrifice like the widow was. And I'm telling you that, that pursuing Jesus is going to require you to sacrifice some things. And so, are you, are you going to continue? Because most of us are. I'm just throwing, like, just be okay with that. We can start group therapy together if you want to. But, like, most of us are giving and serving out of our surplus. I got a little extra time. I got a little extra money this month, so I'm just going to give it. Those types of things. And, and honestly, Jesus is saying, no, I want, you to, I want you to give and serve out of sacrifice. I want you to follow me, and yes, it's going to cost you something. That's what he told us in Luke 9 last week. He said, look, if you want to follow me, man, you've got to lay down your life. But come follow me. It's so worth it. It's so worth it. Go do what he's, man, whatever work it is that he has prepared for you, however you are an instrument in the hands of the Redeemer, man, get into it, because I'm telling you, it's so much better than everything else. It is. You're gonna have, but you're going to have to sacrifice time, comfort, and the last one is the hardest one. It's autonomy. People don't think I use fancy words, so I found autonomy in my thesaurus and work. But really, it just means independence. It means independence. That you're going to have to give up. That's what he said in Luke 9. You've got to give up your own way. You've got to decide that his agenda is more important than your agenda. Paul's going in Philippians 3. He's like, I've just determined that all these other things are worthless. They are garbage compared to the value of knowing Jesus. I want Jesus to be my one pursuit. And I'm just going to let everything else just... I know, man, I get it. We've got to have a job. We've got to pay bills. I understand all of those things, but don't miss out in the middle of it all on pursuing Jesus. He is worth it. And so here it is, autonomy. I believe it becomes your last act of independence for you to make this decision right here, right? You get to choose today, 2021. You've got the rest of the year in front of you. And you get to choose today the what and the who you are going to pursue. And if it's Jesus, then it's your last act of independence because you are following him. You become like Ananias. It's like, God, I don't know about that Saul of Tarsus, but okay, I'm going to do it. I'm scared to death, but I'm going to do it. Like, I don't know if you heard about Saul, but like he's killer of Christians. I'm a Christian, but I'm going to go tell him what you told me to tell him. Why? Because you told me to. And that's what, that's what I mean by losing your independence. Is when you follow Jesus, right here, palms up, hands out, and you're going, okay, God, I'm all in. All, everything, all that I have, all that I am, I'm taking all the chips of my life, and I'm putting them in going, here I am. I'm yours. Do with me what you will, how you will accomplish it, I'm just, I'm all in because I'm determining, like I hope that you will determine that Jesus is worth it. Your last act of independence to get to choose the one, the who you will pursue. Because when you choose Jesus, you are choosing to place yourself under his authority, right? And to do and accomplish the things that he has for us. It's the best decision you could ever make in your whole life. He's got great things in store for you. 
I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. Why don't you stand up? Father, you are good and right, gracious and kind. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word, the challenge of it in my own life. And uh, Father, I I just pray for us as a people. God, would you help us um, in the midst of it all? Um, Lord, just to, to, to yield, to surrender, to give up our rights and privileges and just put all the chips in for you, God. It is worth it. Jesus is worth it. Thank you that you chose us. Thank you that you chose to send him to die for us. Thank you that you invite us into this amazing relationship with yourself Father, as we sing, would you be honored and glorified in these moments in Jesus' name we pray.